good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Maxwell. Good afternoon, Dan. Andrew, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this series. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Hello, Gavin. Hello there. How are you doing? I'm good. Yourself? <laughs> not too bad. Not too bad. Um, are there many joining us today? Yeah, there are a couple of people on the call. Yes. Yeah. Hello, Gavin. Hello, Mr. Andrew. Hello, Mom Kadafa. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Victoria Madego, and I'm super excited to have you here. Um, UWEM will be doing, stating the housekeeping rules. Good um, afternoon. Um, we are really excited to have you join us for this panel discussion. Um, housekeeping rules, please everybody mute your devices. Um, we don't want any interference in any of the conversations um, and we don't want distractions. We want to get the best out of the few minutes or hours that we have to spend today. Um, thank you all for joining once again. Um, the Support for Africa Initiative or the campaign was actually put together by very interesting people from across the African continent to sort of spotlight, you know, the challenges that entrepreneurs are facing during the COVID pandemic pandemic and you know create resources and create avenues that these entrepreneurs can use to thrive and that is why this campaign was put together um, it has morphed into different facets from um, the tell africa farmer stories where we've interviewed farmers from across nigeria um, to this this panel discussion which we know will be really really fun and engaging um, i'd like to call on our host Give me one second. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon to everyone around the world. I can talk to you in the community. We're trying to get a couple of more people into the meeting so that we can start. Um, so, while we're waiting for our host, Paminda, I also would like to call on um, our moderator, Victoria. Um, Victoria, do you have anything to say while we wait for Pini to join? Good afternoon, everyone. Well, Thank well, you guess. so much for coming online to join us in this conversation huh? today. Please, we would appreciate if everyone can mute their devices so that we don't have interference and we can listen to each other and get the most out of this session. Once again, thank you so much for coming online. While we wait for Pamindia, I would like to introduce all the panelists for today. Very interesting. They have um, from diverse background to speak to us about how we can unlock the food supply chain. During this pandemic, we realize that the food supply chain has been broken. Those at the farm gates are experiencing food wastage. However, those in the urban area are suffering from food shortage. The first thing that left the supermarket shelves were the food items. Food-based items were the first thing that were exhausted at all supermarket chains across the world. 
what are we going to do to ensure that these supply chains thrive and we don't have food insecurity crisis going forward? We have a farmer who is very knowledgeable and vast about the pains farmers go through and endure. Mr. Jewel, he will be sh sharing insights about what the farmer, from the perspective of the farmer, what they intend to see, the changes they expect. We'll also be hearing from Mr. Thomas Ogundere. He will be sharing as an original equipment manufacturer what they've also experienced. How can digitalization revolutionize this supply chain? How can it unlock the supply chain? This will be shared by Mr. Mike Dollar, who has great experience in exporting products with his digital platform from Africa and within Africa. One Agrix will also share how they have helped farmers be included effectively and adequately in the food supply chain. And that will be done by Diana. We cannot unlock the food supply chain unless we have effective financing models. And Mr. Andrew and Mrs. Kadafa will bring their wealth of knowledge to share how this financing models and their experiences can help unlock the food supply chain. Even when we have all of these players, we need someone to push these policies across to all government agencies and stakeholders. And for that reason, Mr. Chika will be having that conversation on what ways and methodologies can be employed to ensure everyone is included in unlocking the food supply. Once again, thank you everyone for coming. I believe we will have a very interactive session and very educating session that will turn into real terms and tangible impact in the life of everyone because without food, we have no humanity. Oh, yeah, I'm in. Welcome. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm sorry we had a slight technical hitch and sorry for the delay in starting. I just wanted to um, welcome everyone um, and say thank you to the speakers and to the participant, over 750, 750 people registered from across the continent. So welcome to the African Farmer Stories, unlocking the, flu the food supply chain. I just want to set some kind of a context, particularly in the light of um, the horrendous coronavirus, not, never mind the health impact, but also the phenomenal economic impact um, that the world is enduring, but particularly the African continent. And, and really provide some context also to the support for Africa SMEs and why we volunteers felt it was important to, light, to shine a light on the African um, micro, small and medium enterprises who we all know are the lifeblood of Africa. Let me begin by just sharing a couple of um, two very interesting quotes from two very different um, leaders, African leaders, one a private sector, the other is government, because we know post COVID, um, in terms of reimagining Africa, the role of society, the role of government, um, as we've seen throughout this um, coronavirus experience, and the role of business are going to be central 
in reimagining and reigniting the African continent. So let me read to you one quote, which I posted on my LinkedIn because it resonated with me. And to my amazement, it resonated with over 33,000 people as well. I would rather argue that we need to mobilize the mindset rather than more funding. After all, in Africa, we have everything we need in real terms. Whatever is lacking, we have the means to acquire, and yet we remain mentally married to the idea that nothing can get moving without external finance. We're even begging for things we already have. That's absolutely a failure of mindset. And that's President Paul Kagame. And I posted this, I think it was beginning of April, just at the height of the coronavirus. And 33,000 people responded and resonated with the thing, two things that Africa does have everything and that what's required is a change in the mindset. Another one is from my former, um, from Tony Alumalu, private sector leader, chairman of UBA, but more importantly, my former boss at the Tony Alumalu Foundation. As Africans, he said, we need to embrace with deep conviction the idea that Africa is and can be the source of wealth for its own people. No one but us will develop Africa. We all know that Africa is blessed with unprecedented natural resources. 60% of the uncultivated arable agricultural land and the precious metals and minerals, untapped <coughs> oil and gas, are all to be found on the African continent. But its most precious resource is its human capital, the young demographics. In my five years of living and working in Africa um, and working across the continent, interacting with young, ambitious, hardworking men and women, they are the most valuable underutilized asset. Through them and with them, we be I believe and we believe Africa can define its own future, forging new economies for the new world environment. For that to happen, as President Kagame and Tony Anumalu has said, we need to mobilize the right mindset. And in a sense, now African SMEs, smallholder farmers, now is the time for you to organize and really seize, I believe, the opportunities that have, you know, that have been afforded to us through this coronavirus. Yes, it you know, has, has had a devastating effect in terms of health, but I, you know, in terms of eco economies, it's also decimated the economies. But we as entrepreneurs and SMEs know that in every devastation and every challenge, there is an op opportunity. And with that, we, we launched, um, at, it didn't start off as a sector specific um, campaign. It started off as it is a support for Africa SMEs, but we found that the African farmers were not, their voices, their stories, their struggles during this coronavirus were not being heard. Neither were we able to, and, and we could see, you know, images of, you know, a supermarket um, without any food. We saw that a lot of the farmers' food was going to waste. So there was a complete breakdown in the supply chain. And we know that across the African continent, one of the things that's become very clear is that African and the African politicians, policymakers need to bring back many of those supply chains back to Africa. And through those interviews, we, I mean, we, we, what we did was to literally interview a lot of farmers and really amplify their stories on social media so that their voices could be heard. Unlocking the food supply chain, this panel discussion that um, um, Victoria and, 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 and the team behind this has, has literally assembled is, is literally a response to that, which is yes, we can amplify this story, but actually African smallholder farmers, African farmers need some real solutions. And we need to bring together people who have the power and the resources to make those solutions a reality. They raised a number of questions, including how do we change the narrative of African farmers being some of the world's poorest? And I've 
witness firsthand while, while I was traveling across and working in Africa, while they are feeding the African continent and the world. So how do we change that narrative? Storytelling is the most powerful way of doing that. How can we strengthen that food supply chain amidst this pandemic, pandemic but also beyond it? How can farmers leverage digital technology to fix the food insecurity? Today, our panel of experts will, di will directly address these and other questions as they relate to the African farmers, especially the smallholder farmers, the unsung heroes of this coronavirus. I know that when I launched the Tony Nunu Foundation Entrepreneurship Program in 2015, I was blown okay. away by the fact that 30% to, to 40% mm -hmm. of the received in the uh, This person is talking, he's making a presentation. And, and, and 2019 and 20. 18 when Nigeria was shut down from 20,000 to 200,000. What blew me away was that 30 to 40 percent of young Africans saw agriculture as a business opportunity. So they, you know, and, and they so they don't shy away from the opportunities in the agriculture space. And but they do need the resources, they need the funding, they need the right policies in place in order for them to benefit from the 60% of the arable land that exists across the African continent. I'd like to introduce you the, to you, to Victoria um, Meddor, who is just a formidable force. She holds an ag a, a, a bachelor's in, agri in agricultural economics and an MBA. Um, she's currently, if that wasn't enough, she's currently also um, doing a master's in marketing and innovation um, at uh, Metropolitan School in, in Business in the UK. She is the agribusiness expert at the, um, at the Bank of Industry. She's an advocate of, for ag agribusinesses and their growth in Nigeria, but across the continent. But I've got to know her over these last three months, also as an extraordinary mother, as a wife, as a daughter, and as now a very dear friend, she's formidable, she's inspiring, she's an extraordinary storyteller. People like Victoria and the team behind this and all of you who are gathered to listen to this panel, to which I thank you from the bottom of my heart, they are reimagining Africa. They are, the, they are the people who will play an amazing role in rebuilding and reimagining society, business, and government. And with that, I hand you over to Victoria, and she will now, she has already begun the introductions to her team and to this amazing, amazing um, panel on unlocking the food supply chain in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I truly appreciate. Thank you so much. So I will go straight to the business. We will be talking first with Jewel and um, Thomas. Jewel is um, a model farmer, a social entrepreneur, and a rural development expert. He is also an alumnus of Tony Elumelu Foundation. Uh, where he was awarded the most impactful young entrepreneur in Africa. Joel is an executive of Atari River Integrated Irrigation Initiative in Uganda. He is going to be no, talking about how farmers, their role to help us unlock this food supply chain. With him will be Thomas Ogundira. He's currently the Managing Director of Big Dutchman Agriculture Limited. He is recognized as an agricultural leader within the African continent. And you, we know that Big Dutchman is the world leader when it comes to agricultural, um, the poultry equipment sector. So we we'll like Jewel. Hello, Jewel. Yes, hello. 
Oh, the wind was so near. Please. Hello. 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 Good afternoon to you, Joel. I'd like to ask the first question is what do you think is the threat to the agricultural sector? Because it, if the agricultural sector, the food sector is threatened, the livelihood of humanity is threatened, what are the key things to ensure that food supply is sustained from the farmer's perspective? Thank you. You may unmute your mic. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Victoria. Vir uh, and the entire African Farmers Stories team. Uh, the extraordinary panel of unique uh, leaders of thought that I happen to be part of. It's with great humility. It's with great humility that I address. No, get up. Hello. I can hear you, sir. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, with great humility that I address an audience of global stature. And also with profound hope that the conversation that we are going to engage on now will touch and shape the future of an African farmer. Indeed, during this period of COVID, farmers have played a very pivotal role in ensuring that everybody has food on his or her plate, especially in Africa. Unfortunately, farmers in Africa, especially smallholder farmers that I happen to be part of, in Africa, in Uganda, happen to be some of the poorest human beings alive in the 21st century. Yet they're putting in a lot of effort. They're hustling to make sure we're fed. Now farmers have been bashed with all sorts of challenges. Uh, the greatest challenge that farmers go through on a daily hustle because they cannot afford to access good and improved seeds to improve their livelihoods. Uh, the other challenge that farmers are going through has to do with climatic changes exacerbated by global warming. We have lots of droughts. We have a lot of uh, floods currently affecting and ravaging most parts of uh, African communities, then farmers can't access crop extension services. Yet the state of community access roads in rural parts of Africa are in a very sorry state. Now the other challenge uh, that farmers, and I think this is going to be very important, is the issue of post-harvest losses and handling. In some incidents, actually farmers lose up to 60% of their crop. Now, Victoria brought out an interesting angle. People in urban areas are going hungry, especially in this uh, era of COVID. And yet a lot of food is rotting away in villages because the roads are too bad for any kind of transporter to access. Two, farmers are too poor to afford cold stores, cold rooms. They cannot afford warehouses, nor can they afford silos. Uh, another challenge uh, that rural farmers are facing, especially the smallholder farmers, uh, got to do with access to cheap finance and uh, or insurance, crop insurance to mitigate against the many risks that farmers are now going through. Now, as I continue, I'm just going to use one sim single uh, value chain in my country that incidentally, is making our economy boom. Now, Uganda is one of the biggest producers of uh, coffee. And as you're all aware, coffee trades second to oil on the world market. 
Now, smallholder farmers have been able to produce just last year, 2019, Uganda was able to export 7 million bags of coffee and uh, earn approximately 34.7 million US dollars. Now, when you look at this scenario, the farmers who are putting in their effort to produce are poor. Now, the people who are making money are now off-takers, uh, the exporters of coffee, and mostly multinational companies. Now, I was just doing a bit of research earlier. In the US, Starbucks sells a cup of cappuccino at approximately 3.4 US dollars. Now, meaning from a kilogram, because a kilogram of uh, powder coffee is able to make 80 cups. You know. So that means from 80 cups of cappuccino, you know, they're making 240 US dollars from just a kilogram. And now the farmer who produces this premium commodity okay. that's trending on the global market. It's poor. Interesting. 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 Absolutely poor. Actually, from a kilo of onion, of they call them green bean, before they take it, the process through the process of roasting, and then uh, making the powder for coffee, uh, costs less than uh, on the local market. The farmer gets less than uh, two U.S. dollars for a kilogram of coffee. So. If African governments don't become serious, the whole idea around governments in Africa and their support smallholder farmers who form the majority of farmers, farmers in Africa in my country are smallholder. Those with one acre of acre. But that with the trend, as business people, as exporters are becoming richer, African farmers are becoming poorer. So I call upon uh, governments, fortunately, uh, the aim of this uh, conference is to appeal to policy leaders, uh, leaders of thought, to change business. Business should not be as usual. Now, uh, in 2003, in Maputo, there was a clear declaration that if the rural parts of Africa are supposed to change, then investment in terms of budgetary allocation should be not less than 10% to the agriculture sector. Now, uh, they just passed a Ugandan budget a few weeks ago, maybe one week ago, and the entire budget to agriculture is just 2.9. So government is prioritizing things that are not going to transform Africa. Mr. Joel, Mr. Joel, Mr. Joel, Yes. Because we are very conscious with our time, we would like you to tell us exactly how we can, as farmers, help the supply chain in just a minute, because we want to stick to time so that we can get the most out of this. We would prefer to have solution-based points so we can now, protect basically. policymakers. Basically, the way things are standing now, Victoria, if community access roads are not fixed, because like where I am now, landslides have cut off some areas that produce lots of Irish potato. So Irish potato cannot be supplied from those poor areas in urban settings. The supply mode is donkeys. How many donkeys would you need to mobilize a thousand ton of uh, Irish potato? So government must prioritize fixing community access roads. Government must prioritize putting up storage facilities, both coals and warehouses, to help the yeah. entire distribution one, chain. One, 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 one. Otherwise, for now, with this kind of situation, things are just going to get worse. And those urban dwellers are going to die of hunger. Hello? Thank you so much, Mr. Joel. Thank you very much. We would like to go over to Mr. Ogundiro. Mr. Thomas. Um, Mr. Adetun, you keep on muting yourself and you are actually distracting the 
Um, so, uh, Mr. Agundere, thank you very much for giving us your time. I would like you to help highlight some points that can enable us as farmers, as producers of food, to unlock the food supply chain. What are your experiences? What are the things you can, can tell us categorically that can help farmers at the bottom of the pyramid unlock the food supply chain? Thank you very much. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Victoria, for putting this uh, um, extremely um, amazing audience together and also thank you very much for having me here. Um, um, of course, uh, we from Big Dutchman, um, we, um, we have a very broad um, view of, of, of the industry, though I would not, uh, I would not ne neglect that uh, our, our view is uh, uh, pretty much um, focused on coming from the, from the industrial sector. But however, um, maybe just a brief idea from from personally and also from the from the experience we have here and also understanding what a farmer has to do or what is what what are his um, his core I would I wouldn't say obligations but what are his core duties I mean the farmer's main goal is to produce food and good crops uh, or healthy animals in order to make a living and to feed the population very very essential and vital responsibility. Farmers are responsible for all the crops, for all the livestock that are needed for us to survive. And um, how does a farmer do that? A farmer is going through the planning, he's going to, he's to, he's going to do the planting or the stocking of the flock, he's going to fertilize, he's going to feed, he's going to harvest either the broilers or he's harvesting the eggs. And at the end of that, underneath, um, the farmer will have an income. Um, and this farmer's income is um, one of the major challenges that we see here in the market that uh, very much often people are working hard day and night, 24-7, um, taking all the points mentioned into consideration. But at the end of the day, the income is just not enough. Now, what can be done? What can be done? Because the farmer's income basically is the key or is, yeah, is one of the keys to unlock um, this chain, the moment the farmer has a sufficient income, farming is becoming attractive, the farmer can expand, he can expand his operations, and so on and so forth. And this is what needs to be considered. So the farmer's income need is one of the key values that we have to look at. But the farmer's income can only be as high as the farmer can go. And uh, definitely what we see, what we can, what we can say from our experience, um, if farmers rely on the idea that government is going to help them, it's going to be a problem. They are challenged, as, uh, the, as, the, our, as the speaker before just mentioned, with a, lot of, with a lot of obstacles, whether it is the weather, it's the crops, it's the animal health, whatsoever. There are a lot of challenges already out there. So for the farmer, it is very, 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 very important um, that he is able to make a living, that he has the income he needs, but he cannot rely only on the help of others and also not rely on the help of government, although we personally, we all would appreciate that. So what are, what are we doing? What, what can be done? I mean, it's always, I, I really have to refer back to what Big Dutchman is doing. We said, okay, we cannot, I mean, Big Dutchman is always known for the four, for, for one thing that we are only dealing with the so-called big farms with the big plant with the big players um, and I would also try or I would also like to re revise that picture a bit we have done a lot in the past uh, we invented systems one of our systems is the easy step 56 it's a very simple uh, cage system for 56 birds which you can have in your backyard we are running a microfinancing scheme because what we saw is the access to funding is a problem um, in the entire West African region, so we are running our own microfinancing scheme. Um, 
these are just two points or two incentives um, we, we are currently um, um, managing and we are currently implementing or we have implemented it already in the Nigerian and the, in the Ghanaian market. Um, so there is help, there is support from the private sector. Um, but pretty much often we are facing challenges or we are facing, of course, competition from abroad. We have the Chinese, we have the Indians whatsoever who are just here, who are just in the country dumping their equipment and then they will not, they will not be seen again. Um, and that is why I want to close the circle. Um, if farmers want or if there's the idea of unlocking the supply chain, there are a lot of factors, but one factor also have to come from the farmers themselves. Um, it might be difficult at the beginning, um, but seek for quality, look out for quality, look for companies who are willing and able to help and to support. And it's not only Big Dutch, we have competitors, there are companies all over the place who are doing that, who have similar schemes. And um, try to look for the right partner. This is something that is mandatory. If you have found the right partner, try to grow with him, but also be open for new inventions. Sometimes we are conducting um, training sessions here all over the country in Nigeria. We are inviting all our clients, our clients who are, who are, or farmers who are even not our client. We are, we are inviting them for workshops and uh, the, during the last workshops, uh, almost in Ibadan, we were confronted uh, with heavy resistance where farmers and small farmers were telling us, yeah, you people, this equipment you are having, how can I run it? How can I do it? This is nothing I can run on my farm. And uh, I said, hey, look, I said, of course, you have a farm with one, one, 100 or 200 or maybe 500, 500 birds, but that doesn't mean that you cannot think into the future. That doesn't mean that you cannot have the first step of optimization on your farm. It's also pretty much based on the on the intention and of the ideas the farmer has himself. You also need to understand that times are changing, things are moving pretty much faster. The old farming model from 50 years ago doesn't apply to our time anymore. So what, what needs to be done? The farmers also have to um, kind of envision that the times have changed and that there's need for change also in between the farms. That doesn't mean that you have to buy heavy duty or high, highly expensive equipment, but start with quality, start with good equipment, and seek advice. We are, we as, uh, as a company here, we are helping, we are supporting um, where, wherever we can. And if it is just theoretically, we have f uh, farmers that are calling us, asking us about biosecurity. So we will, we will help, we will direct free of charge. We are not, we are not looking into that because we have a common approach and we, are, we also, we are, we are also very serious in terms of our corporate social responsibility. So, um, but it, at the end of the day, it pretty much depends to choose the right partners to envision the future, to envision also maybe the first step into technology, have a small solar system on your farm. Don't depend on, uh, on, on, on grid electricity. Um, whatsoever. There are, there are many, many opportunities, but farmers also need to be open for this step and they, and they, they also need to see that this, is a necess that this is necessary nowadays. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas and Mr. Jewel. What I um, understand correctly is that Mr. Jewel is saying that there needs to be more inclusion and value addition to unlock the supply chain. And Mr. Thomas has rightly said that as a group, they provide some form of funding and have also tried to include the smallholder farmers with the kind of technology they're beginning to deploy. And they're also ensuring that there is knowledge transfer. These things are very critical. Um, uh, Mr. Jewel has stated that value addition will help to unlock the food supply chain locally because it will reduce the wastage at farm gates. With that, we will go over to uh, Mr. Mike Dollar. And Victoria, can I just ask a question of Thomas? We will have to wait after right. the session to take all the questions um, randomly. So we will go over to Mr. Mike Dollar and Mr. Uh, and Miss, Mrs. Diana to understand how digitalization can help to unlock the food supply chain. 
knowing that smallholder farmers, they are slow in adoption of the digital uh, um, technology at the moment. How can they be included in this digital platform? And how can the blockchain system help to unlock the full supply chain such that, such that these smallholder farmers will be able to earn more and live above the poverty line? Thank you very much. So I will call on Mr. Mike Dollar of Cocodil. Mike Dollar is the founder of Cocodil, an export platform, and he has done a whole lot in ensuring that the, the um, food items from Africa are able to meet international standards. Mr. Mike, over to you, please. Hi, greetings Hi. to everybody around the world. Nigeria, Ghana, Uganda, saying hello to everybody. Thank you, Marido, and thank you for the host. First of all, Africa is growing, and we need to connect with this digital age in a more efficient way. Africa was disconnected from the global trade largely over time, and it's affected its supply chain. Now, going straight to your question, how can farmers be included to be able to get better profit? from their productions. First of all, I'll go with a Hello, Mr. Mike, are you there? A woman that called on the afternoon. She said, she can you hear me, please? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, you can hear me now. Is it clear? Yes, sir, it is clearer now. Okay, brilliant. So the story of the woman, she sells fish in large stock. She called in in the sunny afternoon that she has large stocks to sell, that all her capital and investments is in it. We deployed a marketing campaign targeted at our location. Within 24 hours, a large event hotel center called R bought over 70% of our goods. The finding from this is that market access is essential to agriculture. And farmers need to take cognizance that marketing is part of agriculture. They should set part of the budget to get this done. With the digital age and marketplace platforms, now we can reach across all global markets, across different countries and in local communities. This has, this has opened up the market opportunities and it is increasing the profit margin for the farmers, which is increasing their productivity as well. Now for the blockchain, you need to understand that now you can track trucks with blockchain. You can understand the temperature from the tracking device on the trucks to be able to ensure that goods coming out from the farm gates are going through the right method and getting to the right place at the right time. As Mr. Joel earlier said, that largely lots of goods or foods are lost at the farm gate. We need investors to come into the farm gate in like kind of a rural, urban, industrialization plan and invest there so that it can decommoditize some of these goods which will increase its shelf life and it can reach even new markets with new type of value which brings in better return both for the decommoditizer and even for the farmers. Thank you so much, Mr. Mike. That was very, very straight to the point. How digital platform has helped to improve the life of a farmer. It includes how within 24 hours, the tools we use matter a lot. 
So Diana will speak more to this and help us to understand ways that we can actually and effectively bring them on board so that their standard can be acceptable by those that actually need their produce. Thank you, Diana. Yes. Uh, hi, Victoria. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Victoria, for having me here. Thank you, Paminda, for having me here. Um, first of all, I would like uh, to say that, you know, SMEs are econ um, backbone of economies, but I truly believe that farmers, especially smallholder farmers, um, they are the ones that fit all of us globally. And, you know, no matter how the world um, is, is um, you know, technology is increasing, it's advancing, we must not forget that, you know, it's not about, you know, the doing away with the old and going in with the new is about bridging both worlds together and how we bring farming and technology um, together. Now, um, Mike, Mr. Mike has already, you know, talked about digitalization and how, you know, e-commerce platforms could actually bring market access. So that is uh, one way that, you know, we could liberate trade um, amongst smallholder farmers. That's one. Uh, reason being, I say that is because uh, mobile internet is cheaper now in Africa. There is higher penetration of um, mobile phones within um, the, across the continent. And encouragingly, we do hear, um, you know, in, in numerous research that even smallholder farmers in rural areas are now being more connected via their mobile phones. So what does this mean um, for, you know, smallholder farmers and, and how can they contribute um, by unlocking the food supply chain, right? So this is how, um, what we can do is to actually bring market access to them um, via e-commerce platform um, via utilizing their mobile phones. That's one way. Um, when we say that, what we do is we're actually reducing the middlemen that eat up a lot of their margins um, and, and let them actually have um, better profit margins, um, have better livelihoods by being on, um, by utilizing uh, digitalization um, and as, as, a, as, as of what Mr. Mike has mentioned. So that is one way. Now, I, let me give you an example. So now just now, Joelle mentioned about, you know, COVID-19 pandemic has actually um, created a lot of um, food loss across the continent. And this is not only Africa, this is throughout the world. We do get farmers um, messaging us, you know, our team, uh, we came up with the One Agrix Farmers Helpline where we get distress calls by farmers and saying that, you know, many of them are smallholder farmers, by the way, uh, saying that, oh no, you know, we have lots of food loss. How are we going to clear them? Right. So as an e-commerce platform, as a B2B e-commerce platform, what we do is we immediately um, pivoted, asked our tech team to actually find a way to actually to, to clear this food loss. So um, I'll give you an example. So there is a poultry um, and egg seller in Nigeria. Um, she messaged and she said, you know, you need to help us clear some of our eggs. You know, they are going to be thrown away. What do we do? We actually use technology. We onboarded her on our platform, connected her with two NGOs using technology um, within the proximity of her egg farm. And one of it was uh, Mama Moni Foundation. Um, the, other found yep, the other one um, is uh, Sidika Foundation. So we did actually help to feed using technology and addressing food loss is one, but we managed to feed 200 um, women and children who are hungry because like what Joel said, you know, there's a unique case of urbanization uh, in urban areas where people are going hungry. So this is one example which I think is replicable across Africa. And, and um, this is how, you know, technology can be used for good. Thank you very much, Diana. So we can, digitalization can help in the penetration and unlock the food supply chain using this helpline model that you just stated. Thank you very much. So small order farmers can send you messages that they are having a um, crisis with access to market and you'll be able to link them with the market. I hope we're all taking note of these amazing solutions that are available for us all to utilize and to also share with our network. Thank you, that was very amazing. So I would want to call on um, Mrs. Kadafa, my boss. Um, she has done amazingly well with over 30 years experience in the development um, banking sector. She's um, done a whole lot of training with the World Bank, with Unido, and she's mentored 
a lot of her subordinates, and I am one of um, a product of Mrs. Kadafa. Um, she has witnessed the transformation of the um, Bank of Industry State offices from loss-making position to turn their um, their risk assets by over 400 percent within a 30 to 32 months period. She has done amazingly well, and today she's currently the Deputy General Manager of the Large Enterprise and Bank of Industry, overseeing five business groups. She will be speaking to us about the financing models that she believes are possible for actors within the value chain to utilize in able to unlock the food supply chain. And we have will be Andrew from Kenya, who will also be speaking to the financing model. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Victoria, that was <laughs> uh, so much what they said was said of me. I don't know whether I deserve all those. Uh, I'm so humbled, but I'm not sure I deserve all those uh, descriptions or uh, the adjectives that you use to describe me. I'm just Lolo, um, but I just want to thank you. It's a great opportunity for me to meet this high-powered panelist, experienced people, intelligent, ex and of course, people that have the passion uh, to drive the food sector in African continent forward. Uh, permit me to say humbly that I'm a product of a farmer's child and I'm glad that I, I am one and uh, so uh, agriculture and food comes to me uh, in a very natural way. I also want to put straight the fact that farmers are not poor. We are very rich people. Uh, why do I say so? Uh, because I know that the food sector in the next few years as we are growing in our collective ways, we get to a more than $1 trillion market base. Um, Africa, like we, everybody has said, we contribute so much. But I like to say uh, that in the value chain financing, uh, there is no one method that fits all. And I want to repeat, there is no one method that actually fits all. But what I will always say is that every bit and pieces that are put together make a value. Um, from experience, if I, if I was to take a poultry value chain solution, for instance, uh, within the poultry value chain, there, there are so many players. So there has to be collective responsibility. And what happens most times from credit perspective all, uh, it's that people, are not specialized. Everybody wants to do same thing over and over again. But I think breaking them down uh, helps uh, helps to uh, solve the problem. Traditionally, uh, lending for the agri sector it's it's usually asset based, and people are looking for collateral. People are looking for uh, looking for the right uh, implement. People are looking for things uh, to do. For us to succeed, it has to be cash flow based. And then when you're looking at the cash flow based, my experience has always been that people come together to do uh, things that they are specialized in. Hello, hello ma'am. Everybody's problem. So money is everybody's problem. Everybody needs cash. But let me give you an example uh, of, a, of uh, uh, one value chain that actually interests us. Uh, Coco, for instance. You have to start maybe getting from bottom to up. It's not from, you have to identify the market first. So my take, the value chain of cocoa is like uh, my colleague uh, from Uganda said, uh, chocolates and coffee are almost the same thing. So therefore, first the market, what do we use it for? And people try to do exports. Look at your basic markets. Nigeria or Africa, it's quite a larger that. market. Sorry, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sorry. Okay. Can you hear me? Thank you. 
very, very much. So, yes. Um, yes, Victoria, sorry. can hear you. We can okay. hear you. So, I can um, hear you. in the KYC, we look at relationship bank here and then traditionally, but now we're thinking of value chain. In risk, in credit risk, we're looking at changing the systems. Probably me, if we give you the practical, somebody said, I was talking about cocoa. Cocoa from the farm gates. Uh, you take the cocoa bud, you clean it, and then the, the next thing is for you to have the cocoa powder. So you segment the market and you segment also where the value chain is played. I think that way, uh, for me, in terms of experiences that we have had in the past, it's not to generalize, but break the value chain into bits. And then that way we can succeed. Maybe by the time we come into the question and answer session, that will create, uh, for want of time, that will give us opportunities for us to actually discuss extensively what we need to do as individuals. Uh, thank you. Let me stop here for now, Tora. Hello. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you so much. It, it, really, really interesting to know that uh, there are different financing options and models. We all need to position our tap into this meeting. Thank you. Um, I will be introducing Mr. Andrew. Mr. Andrew um, is a top leader. He's an amazing and award-winning food and agricultural finance specialist. Um, he is he was the head of SME and agribusiness finance at Barclays um, in in Ghana and Fidelity Bank Ghana also. He has uh, a an MSc in marketing and financial services. He's currently the head of banking at Steely Africa, a global development incubator agribusiness finance initiative in East Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and Rwanda. He's actually based in Kenya at the moment, and he'll also be speaking to us about possible financing models that can help unlock the food supply chain. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you, Victoria, and thank you for those kind words. So as you rightly said, I am originally from Ghana, but uh, I have relocated to Kenya, and I am the head of banking sector for Aseli Africa, which is uh, an agribusiness finance initiative of the Global Development Incubator. So aside Aseli, one of the other initiatives is ISA Finance and the Rural Agricultural Finance Learning Lab and many more. <clears throat> um, Joel hit the nail right on the head when he said one of the challenges facing smallholder finance, smallholder finance, maybe let me turn my video off. Yeah, so the main challenge to the smallholder, as Joel mentioned, is access to finance. But before I go into, Vic, can you hear me please? Yes. Victoria, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Andrew, we can hear you, this is coming. Down. Okay. All right, thank you. So before I go into the uh, proposed models that will support unlock the supply chain, let me quickly mention a couple of do's and don'ts around um, financing so that you have on top of your head what you are actually approaching the bank for. To start with, please note that, and I'm speaking from the perspective of a commercial bank, Commercial banks do not support startups, and there is a reason for that. As a business, you will need to go through the cycle, gain some experience before you approach the bank. Every banking facility comes with an interest. And so if you don't have the right 
experience before you take a banking facility, know that you run into difficulty. Number two, a lot more people have mentioned that access to the market is very, very important. Indeed, I will argue that agribusiness finance, sorry, any agricultural value chain must start from the market. So know your market before you decide on what to do because no bank will support speculative activity. That said, I'm going to mention just three models that I think can unlock the financing. One is financing of the farmer, doing direct lending to the farmer. This could be in the form of either lending directly to the farmer or an indirect lending through an FBO or through the Nicholas farmer or the aggregator. Another way of unlocking the supply chain will be doing what we call financing of movable assets. So Joel mentioned that they will need silos, they don't have money for equipment, etc. So another way is to finance just the movable assets. And this could be in the form of leasing, infrastructure finance, warehouse receipt finance, or collateral management. These are all tools that can be used to finance the movable aspect of the farming activity. My senior colleague just mentioned a while ago that another way of unlocking this is through value chains. So you can either finance through the off ticker, do a supplier finance, trade finance, factoring, or many of the likes. But whichever financing model is chosen has to have a risk assessment and a risk mitigation component. I think I will um, stop here and then um, as we progress, we can delve deep and discuss more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Andrew. Thank you so much. You have listed lots of possible ways that models that can unlock the food supply chain. However, in also in your, in your um, statement, you said the risk have to be mitigated. And those are some of the factors that the, the farmers are not able to do at the moment. We will come back to that conversation um, when questions, we take questions from, from everybody. We will go to Mr. Chika Okeke. Mr. Chika Okeke is um, an advocate for right policies to enable us feed Africa. He runs the Feed Africa Network and um, he's the executive director of the network, a non-governmental organization that actively engaged the key stakeholders in Africa's agriculture because he's interested in adoption, implementation of, and the implementation of key policies. That is why we're having this conversation with all the major stakeholders involved, from the farmers to the um, tech enabled, the ag tech enabled partners and um, to the financiers. And as a policy maker, he will help us, a policy advocate, he will help us to push these policies to the right sectors. Why we also at support for African SMEs do the best we can, but we want an all inclusive conversation. So we would like to understand from you, Mr. Sachika Okeke, what exactly the policies can be put in place to help farmers so that the food supply chain can be unlocked not just farmers, all the players in the value chain. Before you start, I would want to say that this session is recorded and will also be shared to all the participants um, today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chikarokeke. Yes, um, 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 
Thank you, Victoria. Can you hear me? Thank you, Victoria. And thank, uh, thanks a lot to Paminda for bringing me on in and to my fellow um, co-panelists that have spoken. My name is Chika Okeke. I'm the executive director of Feed Africa Advocacy Network. So I I'm, going to be, I'm going to be speaking directly from the point of the food supply chain with respect to the COVID. What COVID-19 has made us to understand is that um, our food system in Africa is broken. There are frictions and there are paralysis that needs to be fixed. And what COVID-19 has taught us is that we need to go back to the drawing board to start afresh. And um, our, uh, across the chain, from farmers, from farm to, to markets, from, from farming itself, to processors, to producers, to, to transporters, there is someone who is missing in the link, who, however, is the most important part of that chain, and that is the government. Government actually is the person who dictates the pace upon which all other actors in the value chain act. Government says the music that actually all other the actors dance to. And without the government having the enabling environment, every other value chain will suffer a very big friction. Government is the elephant in the house. Government agriculture is supposed to be government public sector led, enabled, and private sector driven. However, this is not happening in Africa. So I'm going to be speaking from the point of view that our food systems is broken. And what are we going to do moving forward to be able to see that farmers do it right and other value chain actors are actually doing it right? First, your fridge, the leak now. There is, there is a very important need for government in Africa to decide which model of agricultural development we want to adopt. Is it going to be a smallholders farm model or commercial agriculture? Smallholder farmers that produce mm -hmm. less food but actually employ no more. Food. So is it going to be smallholder farmers that produce less food or commercial farms that produce small food? So first, we need to understand what our model is moving forward. Secondly, government needs to be able to adopt Have policies you washing your that boost productivity. Eh? Do you know that farmers are the unsung heroes of this pandemic? They toil day and night to make sure we do not go hungry or starve. Nations are alive and running because citizens still have food to eat. Listen to the African farmer stories and celebrate these unsung heroes. Join OEM at Mansio OEM on Instagram Live at 4 p.m. every Wednesday for an interactive session with our African on song heroes to find out more please follow support for africa smes on facebook instagram and linkedin and s for africa smes on twitter so so, so first government needs to adopt key policies that boost productivity why is it that in Africa, why is it that in Africa, a farmer that has got a hundred hectares of land is considered a poor farmer? But a, a farmer in Europe that has five hectares is considered rich. Government needs to open up the land reforms and make land convertibility easy and make the process of ownership of land easy. A farmer who has hundred hectares of land should not be going to the bank and saying that he has no assets. So liquidity, it needs to be brought in into the land, which is true land reform. Government needs to be able to ask themselves, are we open to GMOs? Are we not open to GMOs? It needs to be spelled out. Government also for productivity, for seed, we need to have what is called the, the Plant Variety Protection Act in all African countries, whereby innovations in seed is patented so that if I have got a, an innovation to give farmers higher yields, this can actually be patented. My intellectual right can actually be protected. Secondly, government needs to watch physical policy. By physical policy, our expenditure to agriculture. You cannot say that agriculture that contributes 70% in employment as much as 30% to GDP, that you are giving it 0.3% of your budgetary allocation. This is lip service. The Moputo Declaration of 2003, African heads of state came together to agree that they were going to give 10% to agriculture. It's not being done. Only about 
turn our mind government as of today is doing that. So African government needs to devote more funds to agriculture, to transportation that stimulates agricultural development, to the energy sector, electricity that unlocks the, the wealth in the value chain. Secondly, government needs to get right the policy to drive foreign investors. We cannot unlock the food supply chain without money. The World Bank estimates that out of the 49 billion that is annually required in dollars for investment in the agricultural sector in Africa, only about 6 billion is coming. Government needs to get right its foreign exchange model. So are we going to be running a peg system that discourages investors so that they bring funds today and tomorrow we, 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 we devaluate the currencies? Government needs to be able to decide and keep in place ease of doing business, the rule of law. Very importantly, money only goes to countries where there is sanity. Money only goes to countries where there is sanity, where there is rule of law, where there is governance. So government needs in Africa needs to be able to get this right. Are we going to be running an import substitution industrialization or an export-oriented industrialization? This is going to dictate whether you are going to keep the interest rates down or keep the interest rates up. If the interest rate is high, it does not encourage export. If it's down, then certainly it encourages it. So we government needs to get this right. Fourth, we need to be able to open up the ability for Africa to trade between itself. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement is right and is spot on. However, it needs to be fair. The ECOWAS trade liberalization scene has made us to see that Africa, West Africa has been a dumping ground. Nigeria has its borders closed because ECLTS is not fair, is not measurable, is not monitored. So in AFCTA, we need to get it right to make sure that Africa is not a dumping ground. Most importantly, Africa needs to adopt a climate change policy. Why is it that in the trillion of climate change fund, green bonds, blended finance, Africa is not getting as much as 3%? So we need to get it right in our climate change policy to be able to attract foreign investment, to be able to assess green bonds, to be able to assess bland, blended finance, impact investment that is out there. Victoria, most importantly, government in Africa need to look at data and statistics. Our data is manipulated. Our data is politicized. The key aggregate and aspect of data is that data must be accurate, data must be reliable, data must be measurable. This is lacking in Africa. So you cannot, you cannot take any data in Africa and make a decision with it. Investors are not sane. Investors are not stupid. Investors need to work with reliable data. Most importantly, we are talking about digital penetration. There can be no digital penetration if we do not have policies from government to enable private sector companies to lay key infrastructures that are going to stimulate this. Good news is coming from Nigeria. The, the, the right of way for digital fiber optics laying is actually being reduced from about 5,600 per linear meter to about uh, 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 near less than one, $1 cent per kilometer. This needs to be encouraged. This needs to be sustained. This needs to be continuously followed up. Finally, most importantly, for a food supply system to be fair, consumers need to be sure that they are getting the food that is quality, that is standard. In Africa, Nigeria across board, you've got a lot of contaminated food, a lot of be it using carbide to ripen bananas, palm oil that is com com contaminated and adulterated. What is mechanism in place for consumers to be able to redress and to get justice? Government needs to be doing it. Most importantly, above everything, security is the most important thing. If you get everything right, from financing to data to climate funds, but you do not have security, no investor is going to come there. We see this in Nigeria that the headsman crisis means that farmers cannot even go to farm. Investors do not put their money and their resources where there is trouble. Investors do not put their money where the risk is too high. We see in Rwanda that even though Rwanda is limited in its resources to coffee, to tea, more funds are going into agricultural development than Nigeria, 
where there is instability, than Ethiopia, where there is population, where there is market, but there is no stability in terms of security. So we need to do the right things to make sure that across board, that farmers have the security they need to be able to move board. Above all things, these policies must be measurable, these policies must be consistent, these policies must be sustainable, they should not be short-sighted, they should not be one year, two years, three years, as we've seen in Africa. Africa needs to develop a 10-year plan for its agricultural development that should not be truncated by political system, that should not be truncated by politics, that should be not be truncated by leaders coming in and going. It should be steady, it should be measurable, it should be sustainable. If we do this, we will unlock the world in Africa. We will be able to get farmers, make sure that their land has the key ingredients of liquidity to be able to get finance. Until we get this, we will continue to punch below our weight as far as food security, as far as agricultural development in Africa. It is not enough for us to have resources. Africa must move from a nature-based strength to a science-based strength. This is what we need to do in Africa. Jesse Ozobel said it, and I quote. So I conclude, and then in the comment section, I can be able to make input. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very, very much, Mr. Chika. I am so glad that you have stated a lot of things and made a lot of points that borders around policies and how government needs to move um, the sector forward with the policies. I'm glad that some government officials are listening in right now. Yeah. They, are, they are listening to what we are saying from Lagos State and from the federal government of Nigeria and, and some other um, government agencies that are outside Nigeria, um, within Africa and outside Africa. Yes, yeah, thank you. We need to help ourselves. We need to help ourselves. As Africans, we need, we are the only one, like Kaminja has stated earlier, that can grow Africa. We need to look in the world. Now we need to um, allow our participants to send in their question to which will be collated targeted at our um, panelists today. However, one round of questions I will ask across the board, and please let us go straight to the point so that we can get the most out of this session. We are um, um, a little bit behind time. This question goes to Mrs. Kadafa. You said that value chain must be broken down and specialized. Please, can you highlight more on how this um, funding can penetrate this, uh, the, the broken down value chain? How can, knowing that there's an issue of collateral and most smallholder farmers do not have collateral and the joy of the farmer is not really in how much he makes, but the impact he makes in the life of people, are they being fed? So, but how then can he expand and feed more people with adequate financing structure? Thank you. Hello, Mrs. Kadafa. Okay, um, since we, Mrs. Kadafa is not on, can we have Andrew answer this question for us? Andrew, are you there? Mr. Andrew, Hello. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, can you answer the question, please? Sorry, I lost connectivity for a while. What is the question, please? The question is, how can farmers access collateral that will help them move their business to the next level, knowing that a successful model can be the speci specialization of the value chain, um, financing the value chain system in a specialized way. Yeah, um, thank you, Victoria. 
Um, it is a sad spectacle, it's a sad, sad state of affairs that usually uh, banks and especially commercial banks will ask, um, will ask uh, smallholder farmers to provide collateral. As Mrs. Kadafa mentioned earlier, um, lending should not be asset based, it should be cash flow based. But because we are where we are, and through um, the rules and the regulations of the central banks, banks as a matter of course have to take on collateral. My advice to smallholder farmers will be to rather work through their value chains. If you do not have collateral and you are challenged by collateral, then you are better off, as I suggested earlier, going through a farmer-based organization, going through the Nucleus Farmer Network or through an aggregator. I am consciously aware that yes, people along the chain do tend to cream off uh, your, your profits, but I think you are better off in that process than having nothing at all. So if you are a smallholder farmer at a startup when you have started, when you don't have the capital base, you don't have the credit muzzle to attract, for example, bank financing, then my best bet or suggestion for you is to do, uh, is to connect to a bigger player in your network to supply you seeds, to connect to through an FBO or a nucleus farmer who takes funding and then passes all some to you. But in doing so, Vic, one of the important things and one of the challenges that has made financing to smallholder farmers a problem is site selling. So while you build relationship with others in the value chain, it will be important that as a smallholder farmer, you also keep your character and uh, track um, your character in check so that you don't disappoint people in the value chain. And the next season, you can get uh, input, you can get support, and you can get your supplies. But if you are supplied the first time and you side sell, you don't go according to the tenets and the relationship that was agreed, then you know that next season you'll be challenged. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Andrew. Uh, Mrs. Kadafa, please, can you unmute yourself? Thank you much. Um, I, I have a question as to what we should do uh, differently uh, for, for us to be able to access uh, finance. Uh, it's been, a, it's, for smallholder farmers, it's quite uh, a tasking uh, uh, relationship. Uh, collateral has always been the main thing, but cluster financing is always the best. Uh, I had uh, Andrew mention that it's always the, the, the best way to go, the option to go. And I'll give you an illustration. If you had cluster farmers of maize in a particular place, say in Kano, for the uh, purpose of people that are African um, and are not in Nigeria, uh, uh, Kano is uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, markets uh, for maize in Nigeria. And, uh, you, and you group them into uh, clusters or cooperatives. Um, one of the basic things is integrity. The Anko Boros program in Nigeria has actually worked successfully, linking the smallholder farmers to the aggregators and then by extension to the processors. Um, that is working uh, successfully uh, in Nigeria where the, uh, the, the processor, who is the big corporate, uh, unbundles the crops to the factory. Uh, that, that is also working. You might even say that, well, the um, profit margin to the farmer might be small. But what is happening is that three things have ha happened. One, there's a guaranteed uptake uh, of the farmer's crop, which motivates the farmer to go back the next year to also farm. Minimum, minimum guarantee pricing, it's always uh, it's very encouraging. The fact that prices are negotiated from the on-site and uh, locked in such that if in the event that anything like a force major comes in, the, uh, the aggregator or the processor will also want to bear the cost. Um, the third thing is that the farmer is uh, paid as I went you. But one of the links that I've discovered is that um, while 
the warehousing facility or warehouse receipt methodology is working in other African countries such as Ethiopia. Uh, that is also quite needed in Nigeria uh, for, for, for the purposes of enhancing uh, the capacity of the farmer, where you can, you can take money uh, take your receipts and then go back to the farm, to the to the bank, uh, assured of the quality, and then it also creates standardization. It creates market uh, involatility for the farmer. So basically, it's we need linkages and we need integrity amongst all the players. There has to be collaboration. There is no one person that can do it all. So collaboration is one of the things that we will always be looking at, so that one growth, expansion. Uh, value addition, which is also key. Warehousing is also key. Logistics is also very key. So when you are doing value chain financing, most of the things that you look at is the cash flow. You look at the ability of the people to also deliver the quality. When we're talking about food, what are we talking about? We're not talking about just eating. We're talking about nutrition. COVID-19 has told us that you need nutrition not just for you to just go and produce uh, uh, maize. These days, the half uh maize is very, very critical. You can't just consume anything and expect to remain healthy. So for the farmer, he needs education. He needs sensitization. He needs the market. He needs the training. And then above all, he needs the commitment to also deliver on the path. So that collaboration is very key in unbundling what we should be doing as African farmers or as Nigerian farmers or in the continent, because we just need to feed one another. Uh, I think basically I will stop here for now. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, this question is targeted at Mr. Jewel, uh, Mr. Thomas and um, Mr. Chika. So any of you can just let me say a word, you know, speak to this, to this question. Government and private sector needs to collaborate, which uh, Mrs. Kadafa has stated again, to provide access to roads to and out of the farms. During our shoots, going from farm to farm, we realized that roads, even within the urban area, the, it's access to the farms are really, really, really not uh, um, easy. We need set up the logistic hubs and, and companies that can help enhance the movement of produce from the rural area to the urban area and reduce the multiple tax being currently levied on truck drivers. How do you think this collaboration can happen? Mr. Jewel, can you please unmute yourself? Mr. Jua, are you here? Okay. Um, please, can we have Mr. Thomas Ogundere? Mr. Jewel, are you are you with us? Mr. Thomas, can we speak to this question? Okay, Mr. Jewel, we can we can hear you. Okay, so we cannot hear Mr. Jewel at the moment. Maybe we're having connectivity issues from his end. Um, Mr. Chika, what can you say as regards to the ability of the government and the farmers and the stakeholders to collaborate. What are the key things that are necessary for them to collaborate so that we can have basic infrastructure as Mr. Jewel has rightly stated that those simple as access to road, mm. they do not have from the farm gate to the, to the market. Mm. What are the, the things that we can, we can put in place to allow for collaboration between mm the government and the stakeholders. Thank you. Mr. Chika. Yeah, yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Victoria. So government, it is, it is, it is called the public-private partnership arrangement, which is the PPP. 
is it is a it is a cardinal framework that is needed to be able to develop the agricultural sector. That being said, the responsibility of government is to put in place key infrastructures such as road network, such as key transport networks, such as the port systems, such as the road. The, the farmers do not have a responsibility to collaborate with government on this aspect. These are key infrastructures that is the responsibility of government to put in place as reflected through their physical, their fiscal expenditures. So this is the responsibility of government. And why this linkage is broken in Africa is because we have got a broken governance system. In every other place in the world, in Europe, in America, you don't see farmers building road. I use, for instance, the Nigerian port, or, port, port, Nigerian, Nigerian port at Apapa. Dan Gote, who is the largest employer of labor, even opted to, to construct that road. But you see, there are bottleneck bureaucracies, there are precedences you don't set. And so that was why that was a challenge. So what do we need to do? Government cannot transfer its responsibility to farmers or to private sector. In every developmental model, the government comes in to provide key infrastructures. And then the private sector and farmers now leverage on this to be able to do their business. So transportation infrastructure, the government across Africa must invest in this to be able to stimulate investment. Port systems, this is the responsibility of government. But beyond this, from this point, private sector companies can now come in to collaborate with government in setting up what is called agro-processing zones, which the government should set up and then in collaboration with the private sector. I give you, for instance, the One port, which is driven by Intel for a long time. This is a private sector, but before they came in, government already created the enabling environment. And let me also say that the basis for agro-processing hubs is electricity. Without electricity, calling a designated center an agro-processing zone or an agro-industrial zone does not work. So it is the responsibility of government to provide key infrastructures such as road, such as transport linkages, and then it is the private sector that comes in. We have Zido Logistics doing a great work. They can now come in knowing fully well that the level of depreciation of their assets in, 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 in lorries, in vans, in whatsoever, that is actually going to pay off. And that if they set up warehouse, that is also going to work. Let me also say that government in Africa has no business with managing warehouse systems. We've seen the Ethiopian Commodity Exchange as a, as a laudable model. So the Nigerian government should encourage, uh, encourage other private players such as what we, we, we have other key players doing and not go affairs commodity exchange, for instance, is doing well. So the SEC and the government should not be playing around, trying to create warehouses in different points. No, this is the responsibility of the private sector. Use the resources to provide road and then the private sector and farmers would build on it to create transport infrastructure, warehouse infrastructure, processing zones that are built upon agro-processing hubs that already have existing electricity. This is the level of type of collaboration that we need to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Chika. Thank you very much. Um, so please, if you've learned something and you think it is quite important, this conversation, you can tweet um, hashtag TAFS2020, T-A-F-S, 2020 on Twitter, on Instagram, or any social media platform. Thank you very much. Um, we want to dive more into the digital platform. How this digital platform can enable access to, to, to um, market? Because we, we've come to realize that they are a key factor in unlocking the supply chain. As we have seen, the likes of um, the, the Triver Greek, the Farm Crowdy, they've helped to aggregate funds and, and structure a new financing model. Some 
financing expert may not appreciate that, um, but it is a model as it were. How then can we use the digital platform um, owned by Mr. Mike and Diana to revolutionize access to market? Because we need these farmers to be included. Again, most questions are saying that you have to educate the farmers. What are you doing to educate the farmers about your platform and include them? Thank you very much. Hi. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, brilliant. First of all, market access. The way it works nowadays is that the first thing people do is the proper search on Google to find any information across the world. It is essential to understand that when people search, we need to be found. For market access, we need to invest largely into marketing to global spaces. What we have done in the past couple of eight years is that we've curated search engine optimizations, digital marketing through Google of different produce across foodstuffs and commodities to the global market. So now when you search from India, from Canada, from US, I need to buy yam flour automatically comes through and we can connect with the request and facilitate the trade information. In Africa, trade information is one of the biggest unnoticed deficit of infrastructure that is meant to be done. I will explain to you. Do you know what is available right now in Tunisia? Do you know that fishes that are, made in Mor that are produced in Morocco are packed in sardines and sold across Africa. There are hundreds and millions of products and foodstuffs across Africa that people don't know anything about. We need to open up this market by disseminating information through the digital platforms. Government is doing their little. We private organizations need to do more because that's how we liberate the people by giving them a chance to trade in the global market. And the ultimate goal of this is that by the time AFCFTA kick into full action, you need to be able to know what is going on in Kumasi. You need to know what is going on in Nairobi. And this information will be vital because if there's a produce in your own local environment that costs like a hundred buck, and in Kumasi, it is 10 buck, you will find a means to put it down. And trade information build infrastructure. This is the sentence where I will explain. When there is an opportunity somewhere, investors find a way to connect that opportunity to make sure that it is profitable. This process facilitates infrastructure build, just like Mr. Chika mentioned earlier that Dangote had to finance some of his investment on even that public work. So let me keep it there. Then for the other one, educate farmers, largely, it's, it's not easy for private organizations to reach to large farmers because it's so wide across nations, across countries, across states. We need government support in disseminating true media, news, newspapers, news medias, and, and radio, which most of them have access to. With this, the media, We'll be able to cut across so much regions like text your new products to 2828 so 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 we'll pick it up and you'll find buyer it's that simple thank you interesting that is amazing it's it's an amazing solution text your product so that you can find buyer diana who is the co-founder of one agri i've also done amazingly well with um, the international trade um, um, organization to ensure that 
the right policies that will push digitalization is on board um, for African farmers. Diana, please, if you could give us more insights to the solutions that one agrics have as of today that are practical, that will truly and absolutely include the um, smallholder farmer. But just before you start, I would want to say thank you to all our sponsors, um, Big Dutchman, Clark Energy, the Business Day, um, Business African Online, Agro Business Center, and to National Economy Paper. They have been very amazing in helping us tell the African farmer's story and support the African farmer. We're indeed glad to have them on board. To all the farmers that have allowed us to come to their farm, Mrs. Okwesho Wemimo, um, Mr. and Mrs. Ngbeoma Kuye, and a whole lost host of farmers that have allowed us to come and interview them at their farm. We say a very big thank you to you. And this series will be unlocked very soon. So please continue tweeting about the African farmer's story because they are indeed. Diana. Yes, can you can you use um, apologies? You froze there. So um, am, is it my turn to speak now? Yes, it is. Please. Yes. Um, first, I would like to say that you know collaboration is key um, for across all value chain, um, including smallholder farmers, if we want to unlock um, you know the food supply chain in Africa. Now, um, e-commerce is a tool um, where you know like what um, uh, just now you know Mike was saying. It's a tool for to prepare farmers to get ready for the AFCFTA. Uh, this is where, you know, Africa as a continent has the um, opportunity to go global. Um, you know, um, I, want, I want to share that, you know, we have the opportunity to be invited last year at African Union Commission um, together with Interna International Trade Center, uh, which is a mandate of United Nations and World Trade Organization um, to speak on the ground with um, farmers and the young um, African youths um, at AU. And, you know, it's very interesting, you know, to speak um, with cooperative representatives, with farmers um, in, across Africa um, who've attended, and really what, how we can help them get, gain market access is to really form um, partnerships or um, drive policies um, at an upstream level. So for us, One Agrix has an official partnership with International Trade Centre, um, and we are mandated to how do we actually help smallholder farmers is we are mandated to actually give um, free access at no charge for them to onboard on our platform. So that's one. Now, um, this is a great opportunity for smallholder farmers and all farmers across the continent to try to or do small scale cross border trade or even trade within your country itself and to prepare yourself, you know, when an AF, F, AFC FTA is ready to global export. Um, secondly, you talk about training of smallholder farmers. Um, we are very blessed to have um, two managing directors um, on the ground in Africa. One, uh, Mr. Said Oshin, he was a former T Tony Alumelu <coughs> um, alumni, uh, works very uh, well on the ground in West Africa, and, um, and he covers West and Central Africa. And then we have Ziad, um, who is part of the Southern and East Africa region, where we also have uh, volunteers who will go on the ground and to help and to communicate with farmers. And they already have mobile phones. We have to realize this, you know, encouragingly, smallholder farmers already have mobile phones in their hands. It's how do we actually um, <clears throat> inspire them, empower them to use their mobile phone to go online, to, to make that, you know, <clears throat> take their um, pictures of their crops, um, it, share it on an e-commerce platform like One Agrix and to trade globally. So this is what, um, you know, our efforts at One Agrix have been trying to do. Um, to what Chika has been saying, <clears throat> it is um, definitely a PPP partnership. And, um, you know, at the same time, you know, it cannot be just one player who handles everything. It should be a collaboration of the different um, stakeholders in the value chain. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, that was quite uh, interesting that you've gotten people that are willing to volunteer to 
spread the word and spread the message that you can be onboarded for free onto the platform. So most times it is about the knowledge. How do people, how does this farmer get to know about this information? Most of them are not tech savvy. And I would like Mr. Um, Chika to speak to this. How can we drive these farmers to, um, to be tech savvy, to be able to onboard themselves with simple, simple technology? However, um, why we say that we also want to say, how can we ensure that government, we've said it over. Yeah, yeah, Victoria, can you hear me? Of this policy. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, I, you. there was a bit of disconnection when you were asking the last phase. I only had how can um, farmers be onboarded into the digital platform. Okay, so um, I'm asking that with this disconnect between mm -hmm. farmers, the, um, the policies, and the government, yeah. what can we really do to ensure that and hold the government accountable so that this revolution that we, we seek in Africa, because that is the only way we can, as people, help each other. How then can we use, um, what, what means can we use to hold our government in Africa accountable so that Africa can feed Africa? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so um, first, let me mention that there is a big disconnect in accountability. Our, our people, now let me, let, the essence of why I co-founded Feed Africa Advocacy Network was that I have played in the private sector. I have also been in government. I was a key member of the River Basin Development Authority. I was a part of a technical team that redesigned that to bring forth the new efficiency and what you have. I've been in government in terms of advisory. I've I've, I've been able to invest in agriculture myself, and I found that we are scratching the surface without key policies. And this was a motivation to co found Feed Africa so that we can be able to hold government accountable. However, we cannot do it on our own. Every person, every citizen needs to ask questions, Victoria. We need to ask questions about accountability. Just two weeks back, in Nigeria specifically, the Ministry of Agriculture said that about nine billion was mismanaged in buying a building that never, never was supposed to. Currently, we are having a lot of allegations against key agencies of government. I wouldn't mention names. These things die off because is the ownership is not there. The ownership is not there. Farmers have this idea that when they talk. You know, we have this feeding bottle government in Nigeria that goes around giving inputs to farmers. When you have 30, 40 million farmers, they select and give to 100,000 farmers. So you, you have people who think that they are dependent on government to be able to get input. So they shouldn't say anything. Even when the, the seed, there is a disconnection, they shouldn't say anything. There is a lot of mess in what government is doing. I tell you something, in the seed industry, government goes, in Nigeria specifically, they give the contracts for seed supply to companies that are restaurants and car dealers that have nothing to do with seed companies. So what happens? These people go to the market, pack seeds that are neither hybrid nor supposed to be what foundational or whatsoever, pack it from the market and then supply back to farmers. That is recycling, and nobody is holding them accountable. So we need ownership. The people deserve the government they get. Africans need to take ownership of what government is doing, not just farmers, across all boards. I've discovered that private sector companies, they don't want to talk. So we are now coming to them to say, don't talk. Tell us what you want to be said. Tell us, don't say it, and then you lose your company. So, Say those things to us, and then we can now say it to the government. So we need more organizations. We need more individuals to key in into the advocacy. 
to be part of our network across all countries so that we can be able to ask the right questions. It begins with us as farmers. It begins with us as processors. It begins with us across all value chain to make sure that we speak out, to make sure that what is supposed to be done is done, to make sure that the seeds that were supposed to be given to us is given to us, to make sure that in insurance, when we insure our farms and they come behind to say, yes, you have two million or one million for us to pay you, but we need to take back one million and pay you one million. They need to come out to speak for. There is a mess, is a rotten system, I'm going to say. So, but ownership is key. Let's own it up across board. Let us know that without government, nothing is going to work. Interesting. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much to all our panelists. We will take a last word from all of our, all the panelists and give us their closing um, um, statement in just one line. Um, we thank you all that we can see the this possibility of collaborating within the platforms within. Um, collaborating with, it, but with each other, either as a farmer or a digital uh, um, platform or a financier or an advocate for the growth of um, Africa. We need to come together and that is what Support for Africa SME is doing and is ensuring to tell the African farmer's story so that Africa can rise and take its rightful place and feed itself. Yes. Having said that, um, I would want to say that if you are a farmer in Africa or you are playing in the value chain in Africa and you would like to share your story with us, please kindly send us a message at info at supportforafricasme.com. The four is numerical four, info at supportforafricasme.com. AfricaSME.com. Follow us on our social media platform, which is already posted on the chat page. Please do follow and hear the amazing things that African farmers are doing to thrive through this difficult, difficult time, regardless of the infrastructural gap. They have still ensured that we are properly fed. Because time is not on our side, we will just take one round from each panelist, their closing um, and advice to all of us that have taken our time to remain to the end of this program. Before I hand over to the host, Ma'am Pemindia. Hi. Can you hear me? Can I go first? Yes, you can go first, please. Okay, brilliant. The biggest thing I observed in Africa is that Africans need to invest in Africa. There's need to get curated information and transparent data to people and for Africans to invest in Africa. If we keep buying lands with all our money and we don't try to invest in ourselves, little can foreign investors do. And for today, we'll be giving out free $20 for anybody that registers on cocodeal.com, C-O-K-O-D-E-A-L.com, to market their goods for them and to get buyers locally and internationally. Wow. Looking forward to greater works working with you all. Thank you very much for this wonderful program. I love it. Thank you so much, Mr. Mike. Deanna, you can go next. Okay. Um, I wanted to say that um, the... You know, the African youths are the future of Africa. And, you know, I, I really, I, I have, um, you know, great engagements with many African youths at my time at um, AU. And, you know, they are really um, the, the backbone of um, economies across the continent going for, I mean, in the continent going forward. And also want to highlight that agricultural sector is the future of, um, or in fact, it should be now, um, you know, where Africa will really succeed. Um, you have great land, great, um, you know, soil, um, great products. And I, I do feel that if everyone collaborate together and come together across the value chain from government all the way to um, private sector, um, I, I do feel that, you know, Africa rising, um, hashtag, it would be um, a, a real thing. Thank you very much, Diana. Mr. Chika, please, can you go next? 
Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you for putting this together. Like I said, this is impressive. This is laudable. In one word, the future of food security, the future of agriculture in Africa lies on the ability of our farmers to be competitive and to be productive. How can we produce more food from one land? How can our farmers get more for less? And how can the pricing of our products compete at the international market? The future of agriculture in Africa is there. It's, it's clear. We just need to do the right things. Jose Ozebel of the Rockefeller University said that two revolutions has changed agriculture in the past. Number one is machines and tractors. Number two is nitrogen and the, chem and the fertilizer, which is the chemical. But the next is going to be information. As Africa begins afresh, can we look for, back to see the lessons that how machines and tractors has either impeded or helped the other people to develop and how chemicals and nitrogen has either degraded the land or also helped. Let us put it together in the age of singularity and be able to tap into information, artificial intelligence and digital technology to move our agriculture from where we want to the Africa we want in 2063. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Jewel, you are unmuted. Please, can you give us your last word, our African farmer. Hello. Well, uh, well uh, thank you so much, Tim, uh, for all your contribution. I must say that Africa has been a ground for several uh, trials from. Uh, at our own government level country, there have been five models so far, investing trillions of Uganda shilling, but things are not working. Now, importantly for Africa, are several issues around the mindset. Speakers earlier spoke about an idea of digitizing Africa's agriculture. Now, majority of smallholder farmers on uh, the African continent, especially in my country, Uganda, are 55 years and above. And uh, technologically, they are not savvy. Now, the youth who should be taken over from uh, the aging population in rural areas have abandoned villages because villages don't have what interests them. Roads are bad, uh, no social life, you know, young people like entertainment. So, government should prioritize investing and transforming rural parts mm -hmm. of Africa to attract young people and then uh, creating programs that inspire young people to love agriculture is probably sexy. But for now, and I look at the future as being bleak for Africa because majority of the young and the energetic don't like agriculture. Our education system has spoiled them to think in terms of comfortable life. They want urban areas. They want to spend all day sports betting. You know, they want to be real estate agents. You know, they like cheap money. So all this discussion we've had now, if governments, if those in the private sector don't invest in transforming uh, rural parts of Uganda, like uh, the speaker in Nairobi was saying, uh, that we need hubs in the village, agriculture hubs, where there will be industrial parks at regional level, maybe at county level. Otherwise, it's going to be an uphill task. Now, the other issue that's a bit critical, you know, there's been a lot of money poured on the African continent. A World Food Program, for example, had a project in uh, Uganda, in regional half of Uganda, where they built beautiful warehouses, invested not less than 4.5 million US dollars. But because of management issues, some of these beautiful warehouses with beautiful cleaning system, dryers, silos are rotting. Wow. So I think wow. yeah, they're rotting away. They're not uh, achieving the intended goal. And yet farmers are continuing to lose their crop in West with white elephants in the vicinity. So a government, especially in Africa, should get down to the drawing board and think. Probably there's a lot of corruption that so has mind. Like in Uganda, for example, cattle have taken over 
the coffee value chain. They won't allow the ordinary peasant in the village to benefit like they are benefiting. The grain industry in my country, maize and rice, has been overrun by cattle. They prefer to import uh, paddy rice, brown rice from uh, Pakistan, from India, because the costs of production in those countries with government subsidies are low. They have mechanized mm -hmm. the agriculture. Now they have frustrated the rice value chain in my own country, Uganda. So, and peasants are ordinary people who will make noise for them. So I like the idea that we convert in this form of platform, discuss mm -hmm. ideas mm -hmm. that can transform mm -hmm. Africa. And it begins with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. It begins with us. I like that part. It begins with us. Thank you, Farmer Drill. This is super, super amazing. Um, Mr. Andrew, please, I know that everybody wants to hear from the financiers because, I mean, you are always the white elephant in every conversation. Please, can you tell us your last words and advice? Make it Please breathe so that we can finish in good time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria. My parting words would be businesses have cycles. It starts from the beginning, goes through a growth stage, matures, and declines. At each stage of the business cycle, there is an appropriate financing mechanism or financing tool. So know where you are in the business cycle and decide or determine which financing tool will be appropriate. It could be money from your own resources, from family and friends, from business angels, from venture capitalists, from development finance institutions, blended finance institutions, commercial banks, and the likes. Do not just start with your business and run to a bank. Know where you are in the cycle and determine which financier to approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Andrew. That was spot on. Know where you play in the value chain and know who should finance you. You must understand the available financing structure. We would like to have from the final, the, the last but not the least, um, from Mr. R. Kadafa. I am trying to find her now. Mrs. Kadafa, please can you unmute yourself? I am not able to unmute you. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Let me say fundamental things, but um, in closing, Victoria, I just want to thank you for putting this together. It's fantastic. I'm always saying I'm proud of you and I'm glad to be associated with you. My last words are commodities are farmers' currency. We should know that. That's your currency. Hmm. But Andrew said particular things that you should know where to play. But in closing, I'd like to say that there are five strategic drivers that we must always consider in, in your value chain financing. The biophysical and the environment, she can make so many uh, pronouncements on that. The demographic drivers, that's the population that is going to, that's emerging. You need, you need the population as to who you want to feed. The infrastructure drivers are very key. We talked about collaborations and collective responsibilities because of the complexities in the value chain. You need the social cultural drivers, which is the change, that's the mindset, the fact that we can, that we can has to be, and we are Africans, I'm proud to be one. You need the political and economic drivers to be able to do and succeed in the agri space. And then the last is that you need the market and infrastructure. These are very essential. What I would always want to say is that the spirit of the fact that we can, as Africans, to be proud of what we have and who we are, the black continent has a lot to deliver for the world. The world is waiting for us and for us to be able to unbundle that special things that we have. But on our own, one of the first things that we must realize is that we must love ourselves. Last word is that warrior dash is like agriculture. Without a mod, 
you can't get bath and you cannot get sweet. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. This is absolutely wonderful. Wonderful. Like the African proverb we say. that it is a version of the hunter story that we get to hear. We never hear the side of the version of the animal story. We need to tell our story by ourselves. And on that note, I would like to hand you over to the host, Ma'am Pamindia Vai. Thank you everyone for having me this evening. Victoria, you are a star. Hello. You are extraordinary. I'll call you back. All the speakers, amazing, amazing, amazing. Put me back. I was born in rural, in rural Punjab on a farm, and I kept remembering how you know the Green Revolution in Punjab came, um, and we are the, you know, Punjab is the granary that feeds the whole of India, and that's where I come from. And yes, we had the chemical, we had the tractors. My father's first wages that he earned in the UK as an immigrant was sent back to his brothers to buy a tractor so that they could continue farming. So, you know, so I have an absolute connection. I think rather than repeating, there's just so much content um, that's been, you know, shared in these two hours, which we will edit and we will continue to share um, the recording as well as stories. I think there's two things that I would just like to close on. One is that we must, as someone who came to the continent to develop and empower African entrepreneurs through training, through funding, and through seed capital, I saw the impact of that, particularly on, on, on young people, 21 to 37 year olds, 30% of them who had chosen agriculture as they So they know there's not just a business opportunity, but it's also and sexy. And what we have to do is to support them. I think what I've learned from this now, reflecting back after five years, that you know these entrepreneurship development programs, which are really skills, business skills development programs, we must not keep them in the urban centers. We must now take them to the rural centers. We need to go to the farmers and actually empower them with the skills so that they can not just be farmers, but they can also become business farmers. So they know how to navigate their ways through government, through banks, through financing, through um, the market, um, to getting their um, products into the marketplace. I feel that that is something certainly a lot of the people, a lot of our panelists, we should come together to see how we can develop specifically capacity building of the smallholder farmers. I think my second point is just listening to all of you is storytelling. I'm a storyteller. I spent 25 years of my life before I came to Africa in 2014 making films and telling stories. One of the films I made was about the impact of the Green Revolution in Punjab. Africa is, is awash with stories and the, and the farmers are the most potent storytellers and their stories are the most powerful. So certainly through support for Africa SMEs and working with Victoria, we need to amplify those stories. I think it just leaves me to say a big, big thank you to this extraordinary volunteer team. Um, all of us are volunteering our time because we feel passionate about Africa. We feel passionate about African SMEs, starting with Victoria, Edmund, Uwam, Linda, Billy, Hilary, Felix, the two Felixes, Belucci, Shola, Davidson, and Desmond. You guys have been extraordinary in the amount of you know, your time and resources that you've spent to make support for Africa SMEs alive and to, and, and to bring this panel discussion, um, which began, I said to Victoria, this is a crazy idea. How are we gonna do this? And then to have 700 plus people register this morning, up to this morning, and then to watch 
um, Victoria manage and orchestrate this very rich, rich, rich conversation. Um, and, and thank you to all the speakers because you all spoke from your heart. You did not depend on PowerPoint presentations. Again, you've given us a lot of solutions and a lot of hope. Um, this is just a start. Africa must reimagine itself post COVID. It is an opportunity. All of the things that Chika has outlined, yes, the government will have a major role to play, but we, the SMEs and, and the African farmers must now organize um, either through new platforms or use existing platforms like the one that Chika has set up to really make our voices heard. Um, African farmers, you must have a, a voice and a place at the table of government, of private sectors, of everywhere and anywhere where food matters. My closing, those are my closing remarks. And I literally really, really thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Victoria, are you coming back or is this? And thank you, so thank you very much. I think this is the, um, the close of unlocking this, the food supply chain, the, the, African, um, the, the African farmer stories. Thank you. Victoria, do you wanna have a last word? Yes, ma'am, thank you everyone.